There you go. Good morning and welcome to part two of Transforming Family Life, a transpersonal approach to parenting. I'm so excited to be here um, for the second part um, because it's really neat to hear about how maybe things from part one were implemented or things that you noticed. So I'm not going to do a full introduction, but for those of you who maybe are watching this recording and maybe skipped over part one, I am Marisol Salinas McCoy, and I am the founder of Essential Wisdom Coaching. Um, and I'm so happy um, to be here. A quick overview of what we're going to cover today is um, we're gonna start with reviewing and a little bit of sharing. So I'm gonna just very briefly talk about um, what we covered in part one, and we'll have a little bit of discussion on maybe things that were noticed about um, our lower self and our centered self since then, and if any of the issue themes emerged in our week. We're also going to dive into preventing and solving problems. So I'm going to go over six ways to prevent problems in family life. Um, and really, like I said in last week's session, it can be applied to multiple areas of our life, as well as two ways to solve problems when they do appear. I would love to say that problems, you know, knowing how to prevent them works 100% of the time, but um, problems always do arise. So we'll talk about how we can um, solve them. And then we will go into the three-step process for change for shifting from our centered self toward our higher self. So last time we did a three-step process for shifting from our lower self to our centered self. And today we'll talk about shifting from our centered self to our higher self, which um, it's really a full six step process, but we'll, we'll cover the last three steps in today's session. So a brief reminder of the workshop agreements. Um, I'm not going to read all of them. If you were here last week, you know what they are. So if you will just type agree in the chat box, letting me know that you do agree to the, and there we go, we've got, we've got agree in there, um, then we can get started. So I do want to, um, review, we, we did talk about this last week, the parenting principles really quickly with the, the framework that we're working from. And that children um, of any age have the innate drive to express their best selves and to develop their highest potential. So that's just really deep inside uh, of everyone, even as adults. Um, I think, I think we do um, want to express our best selves. Children, um, our children, children that we work with depend on us to help them. And their primary motivation is to satisfy their own personal needs and goals. And that in order to do that, they um, do that in the best way that is available to them in the moment. So younger children are very much in the moment, older children, um, emerging adults don't always live in the moment, but their satisfying their needs is um, often number one. So that's kind of the framework that we are um, going with. A quick review of the common parenting issue themes are authority, needs, perception, control, and expectations. So really our, our mighty, our mighty parent and our mini parent come out um, when these issues or can come out sometimes when these issues arise. As well as the aggressive 
lower self characters, the know-it-all, the VIP, the guru, the dictator, and the royal highness. And as well as the passive lower self characters, the know-it-all, the martyr, the mute, the sheep, and the people pleaser. So I'm curious, um, over the past week, since we met um, last weekend, if you noticed any of the themes pop up, or if you noticed um, an aggressive or a passive character um, coming to the scene in, in life. I know that um, for myself, I think having just uh, that awareness, you know, having just done the workshop, it was a little bit easier for me to notice when issues arose and when my lower self character wanted to come out. I was then um, a little bit more aware and able to, to kind of shift out of that. So I'm curious if, if you've noticed anything or if you wanted Okay, so in the chat, we have um, somebody noticed it in other people, but somehow it was a projection. Ah, you, so you noticed your own, a projection of how you used to be with your child. So yes, it is much easier to notice those, those patterns in other people. You can say, oh, I know what that is. Yeah, and then that reflection of, of how we have, and I think, and I think that's wonderful, and um, a, a natural and normal process of that step of, hey, I learned this thing and I can now recognize it. So I think that is super. Yeah, the, the aggressive behavior. Yeah, excellent, excellent. So I would say keep noticing that. Um, and, and I'll, you know, just observe it and, and see how that lands in, in the reflecting. And then when you are then engaging in the future, you'll kind of have that how to um, move a little bit differently. I love hearing that. Um, so we're going to shift now to how to um, prevent problems and solve problems. So we'll spend a little bit of time here. Um, again, feel free to throw in the chat any questions or comments as I as I move through these. I'm going to try and give as much detail um, and some examples so that way you can then implement this. And then remember, it's while we're framing it around parenting and family, this is a perfect place to um, remind you that this can be used in really many areas of life, our personal lives, um, you know, outside of family, uh, work, our career, just in every area, I think it's, it's really useful. So the first, um, I guess, step or skill that can help to prevent problems is using visualization. So I think many of us have in our mind, if we, if we think about what our ideal family life or just, you know, our ideal life in general looks like, right? We many times um, see in media or social media, um, these, these visions, these um, images of what life is like for other people or, or can be like. And visualizing is a great way to prevent problems. So we all know the type of problems that emerge in our family. Um, there's often patterns. And I find that usually it's afterwards where we like picture, um, oh, I could have done this differently or, oh, if I'd only said this, or if I had not said this. So we sometimes, um, it's almost like a movie in our mind of, of what we maybe wish we would have done or how we would like things to be. 
So implementing visualization before problems emerge um, can really help when they do. So what I mean by that is, let's say you um, have this, this idea for family meal time, right? And you can visualize, you know, you can close your eyes or not, um, what it's like, what the family is doing when the meal is being prepared. Uh, maybe you would like people to be involved or maybe um, people are doing other things but nearby and there's conversation or maybe music playing. And then when the meal is ready, you know, everybody gathers and there could be great conversation, laughter, um, whatever that looks like for you, right? We can imagine that. We can picture that. We can imagine um, what maybe smells or, 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 you know, are filling the room. And having that picture then allows our brain to start to implement small changes. Um, I might have shared last week that, that our brain doesn't know the difference between imagination and reality. So we know the difference, but our brains do not. So the more that you visualize um, what you would like family life to be like in many different ways, your brain then starts to help you to make those steps. So that can be like I just did, uh, or like I just mentioned through like active vis visualization, using imagery, sitting and, and doing that. Another way that visualization can be implemented, and I do this with clients sometimes, is creating vision boards. So sitting down and having the activity of maybe cutting out pictures, or if you do a digital version of pulling pictures, um, either from your real life or images that you find, and making a sort of collage. And again, it can be physical or it can be a, a digital version. And of what you want family life to be like, if you have goals, if you have areas that you want to improve in your family life, having a vision board, again, is a reminder if you look at it regularly, your, your mind, your brain takes in those images and they become, uh, they start to become a reality. You start to take steps to make those things happen. And so I, I'm all about vision boards and I recommend that people do them on a semi-regular basis to help with that visualization. Um, and if you're going to do that, look at it every morning and every evening, have it somewhere. If it's a physical one, have it somewhere where you will see it um, on a regular basis. If you choose to do a digital version, maybe put it on um, your screen. So I, I created a, um, a physical vision board that I have just out of reach in my, in my office here. And I took a picture of it and it's the screen, I don't know if you can see it, it's the screensaver on my phone. So every time that I pick up my phone and look at it, it's there, right? It's, it's a visual reminder of how I want life to be. Um, a, another um, way that visualization can work. And, and I think many of us, we're in, we're in a digital world, right? Um, we use Instagram to see pictures, to, to do that. And yet it is um, often, you know, we have to rely on some sort of technology device, which isn't bad. However, I often recommend to clients to print out like we would in the olden days, um, some pictures of family life. Like we take tons of pictures, but do we actually have physical pictures? And to utilize that, to put them, those happy memories, those, those wonderful moments in places where you will see them. Um, and I've had clients like, I don't buy picture frames or I don't have picture frames. They don't have to be formal and framed. It could be just a picture that you keep on your refrigerator or something on your bedroom mirror. So that is another way to help you to visualize the way that you want life to be. Again, 
It's just a regular reminder. And when we see those images, we are more likely to then um, act in ways that we want. So that's, that's one very um, simple and subtle way to prevent problems. The next one is assertion. So this is really, really important, I think, um, for, for all parents, but especially if you have any tendencies toward your lower self character, leaning toward um, the passive. This is definitely useful for the aggressive characters. However, the aggressive, they often already make known what they want, just in a rougher, <laughs> a rougher way. So assertion is really your ability to state what you need, right? So we talked last week, like one of the issues that comes up is around needs. And as parents, we either take the stage and things are about our needs or what we want or what we think, um, or completely to what our children's needs are and to where we're not um, bringing ourselves fully. So assertion is clearly stating either your needs, your expectations, your boundaries, um, what the, 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 well, I said expectations, but what your family rules or agreements are, being assertive. So you can state very clearly, um, let's say it's around dishes. Dishes are something that comes up in my family quite a lot. You can assert, I need you to make sure that you help with the dishes today, right? I'm saying it. Or I need you, today is your day to do the dishes. I need that done before whatever time or whatever it is that you want. Being um, assertive, stating those boundaries, um, especially in um when conflicts arise, which we'll we'll talk about that in a moment, but in by stating clearly what you want, what you need, what the expectations are, that can help to be to solve to prevent problems, because um, a lot of times there's just miscommunication or misunderstanding. So by being very very clear it helps to prevent problems. The next way to prevent problems is through reflection. So I, I talk about this a lot um, with clients about reflecting. Self-reflection, I think, is really important. But also, um, as part of a family, reflecting on family dynamics, family interactions, reflecting on problems um, that occurred. Again, we can't prevent all of them, but when they arise, we can then reflect on how did we handle that? What might I have done differently? Um, what did I do really well um, it, when that problem arise? So by reflecting, by taking that time to really think about um, one problems that, that typically arise or after a problem ha has, has you know, peaked out, really reflecting on ourselves and our own um, behavior and actions and also on the issue as a whole. By reflecting and thinking through that, it then gives us some information and some potential tools for preventing future problems. So if you know something comes up regularly um, with your children or in your family, spend some time reflecting on it and, and seeing like, what don't I like about that? Um, how can I next time, because there likely will be a next, if there's a time before, there's likely going to be a next time. How can I then navigate that a little bit differently? How could I express my boundaries or my needs or my desires um, around this? Um, 
And so reflection. I think reflection is also really great. You know, last week we talked about our lower character and shifting to our centered character. So part of the reflection process is, was I functioning from my, my lower self in that moment? And how would my centered self handle that? So putting it very concretely in, I was in my lower self, how would the centered self do that differently. The next way to prevent problems is through planning skills. Planning is so, so important. And I often, again, <laughs> spend a lot of time with clients on planning. Um, even people who are planners can plan better. And so in preventing problems, you want to have a clear plan. Again, this is often very personalized depending on the parent, the family, the age of the children, like what else is going on in life. Um, but the more you're able to plan ahead, it will help to prevent problems. So one thing that has come up um, a few times with clients recently is, you know, dinner time seems to be a challenge for, for families. What are we going to eat? People eat different things. Kids complain. Parents are tired. Um, and so something as simple as planning a menu for the week based on what you have going on in the week in your family, you know, um, shopping for that and then sticking to it. Having people contribute to the menu can oftentimes either eliminate completely or significantly decrease the issues around mealtime, right? It sounds so simple, and yet these are steps that people don't always take. So planning skills. Um, it also helps to model for children, right? If, if children see you planning, and if you include them, if, if you're able to in some way, um, it teaches them those skills. So you're modeling for them and teaching them also how to prevent problems in their own life. So that can be, you know, for little kids, preschool kids, high school kids, even adult children um, by modeling planning skills, by, sh by showing what you do is teaching them without having to tell them <laughs> you should do this, right? Um, it, it, you, can, you can very subtly weave in planning skills. So planning, again, I, I just gave one example in, in terms of mealtime, but that could be planning your schedule, planning um, your free time, planning self-care, everything can be planned. Um, don't confuse that with overscheduling yourself, which I think many of us tend to do, but creating a plan. If you know that family issues are going to arise, you know, if, if you're dealing with extended family, um, people who don't live in your home, but who are family, and there's going to be some sort of gathering or function or um, where you know conflicts usually arrive, plan in advance how to navigate that. How will you step in and use assertion, right? Be assertive when those things um, want to come want to come to the surface. Or in planning, like if you know uncle so-and-so um, makes fun of another person in the family, don't make sure they don't sit together, <laughs> you know, at Thanksgiving, something like that. So planning really helps to prevent problems. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, family agreements is another really great way to prevent um, problems. This tends to work better when um, it is, you know, who lives with you. Um, or even who maybe if they don't live with you, if they spend a lot of time 
with you in your home or if you spend a lot of time in their home, family agreements really um, are handy. And so I know um, at the end of last week, after the recording stopped, there was a question about family agreements and, and I answered it and I later messaged the person and was like, okay, also this, um, because I knew we were going to talk about it today. So I gave them a little, a little few more tips. But family agreements are oftentimes what we think about as our household rules, right? The rules that we have. And I like to shift away from the language of rules, um, because I think many of us tend to, when we think of rules, then we think about when the rules are broken. And when rules are broken, there's then um, uh, like a punishment, a, a, you know, a consequence, discipline. Um, and, and that tends to have like a negative connotation. With family agreements, it's more um, collaborative in that we agreed on these things as important. Um, and when you don't, when you break your agreement, there is then a natural consequence. So it has a slightly different feel between you broke the rules, you're in trouble, and you didn't hold up your end of our bargain. And so now there's consequences to that. And one thing that um, I will say is, is family agreements are very unique. There are some typical things that families tend to, you know, include in agreements, but it's really, really um, unique to your family situation, why you need the agreements, um, the ages of the people involved. There's a lot of factors that go into it. Um, and this is something that I work with clients sometimes on customizing, right? How do we create these family agreements? And so one way that I um, encourage families to think about it is, and, and I used to do this when I was a teacher, right? Start of the year, um, classroom rules, right? But kids will want to break rules <laughs> if you tell them these are the rules. So we would do agreements and they were based on um, rights and responsibilities in that, let's say in your family, you have a right and you can list the rights. And with that right comes these responsibilities. So example, you have the right to, um, to have, to, to be fed, right? <laughs> you have the right to have meals and the responsibility. And so this is where as a parent, you can then set the expectations. Um, you have the responsibility to contribute to mealtime. You have the responsibility to um, help clean up after meals. So whatever, whatever it is, and, and for them to be family agreements, there has to be discussion. So getting the conversation with children. I've seen children as young as like five, um, and I think they can be younger too, contribute to, to the discussion. Again, as the parent, you are guiding the conversation. You already know what, what you want there to be um, in terms of agreements, but having a conversation with everyone in the family, having them brainstorm what um, the responsibilities are is really important to the buy-in and the follow-through. So you can help guide what the rights are, but really getting input on the responsibilities. You will, you will find that um, children of all ages actually have really great insight. They're very wise in terms of what is fair and just, um, and that's where the responsibilities come in. So I have seen um, some children contribute things that I was like, wow, I don't know if I would have thought of that as a responsibility. Um, it helps them to then agree to the agreements. It helps them to feel responsible, to feel like a contributor in the family. 
it helps them to know that they have a voice in family life. And again, it's not going to make things perfect, but it is good. I find that family agreements um, really help to prevent so many problems. So you could talk about, um, you know, for children who have toys, right? A lot of toys I've heard um, and they have experience, you know, my kids play with all these things and they don't put them away. So it could be, you have a right to have play time or have, have um, play in your life and the responsibility to put things away when you're done playing with them. Um, video games I know are huge in a lot of families, especially now with COVID and people spending so much time at home. Um, it could be you have the right to play video games and the responsibility to limit your time or to um, not hog the, the video games if people come over or whatever it is for those. So family agreements I find are, are really critical. This can be a process. You know, some people do it one time. They have a family meeting, discuss it, it's done. Um, I like to recommend that you meet a few times to discuss it. So say in the first meeting, you have um, a little list. And again, this is very unique. I've known people to have very short lists. I've had people have very long lists. So whatever works for you. And maybe part of the agreement is we will try this out for a week, for two weeks. Um, and come back and see what worked? Or are there other agreements that we need to add? So again, that goes back to reflection. As a parent, you are reflecting, um, thinking about it, but also your children can then reflect and think about, and you'd be surprised, it's often the children who come back with more rights and responsibilities. Um, so maybe do a couple of cycles of that. And then once you feel like you have a really solid um, sort of family agreements, I often recommend that it is really important to finalize it. Make it almost like a contract. Have a little ritual where you all read them and agree and maybe sign it, right? And then put it somewhere where everybody can see it refrigerator is always a, a common place, but it doesn't have to be there. Somewhere where they are visible, where if somebody doesn't hold up their end of the agreements and, and children will call you out, <laughs> parents, um, when you don't do that, you can say, this was our agreement and you didn't hold up your end of the bargain. And so now there's consequences. Um, it's much easier to use that rather than, again, you being the bad guy of, I have this rule, you broke the rule, now you're in trouble. It just has a different feel. Um, and so while you're probably preventing a lot of problems, when that does arise, it's much easier to, to point out what maybe wasn't done or how things were maybe expected. Which brings to the next um, step of preventing problems, natural consequences. Um, I think many of us grew up, again, being punished for breaking rules, right? We got in trouble. Um, I remember being a teenager and being grounded, right? You didn't do this thing or you did this thing and now you can't you know, go anywhere for a week, or you can't, um, you know, whatever it is. And sometimes it made no sense. Like, why am I being punished for this in this way? And so what natural consequences are, is they're not punishments. They are um, consequences that occur for whatever sort of infraction, right? Not meeting these agreements. And a really important piece of natural consequences is 
the consequence has to somehow be tied to whatever rule or agreement was broken. And that's where I think um, families have difficulty. And then more conflict arises because again, children, if you're punishing them and it makes no sense, they are gonna be angry about that. They're gonna fight you on it. They're going to <laughs> cry and scream and yell. But if it makes sense, they might not like it, but it's much easier to express why that's a consequence. So I will give a very real example that just happened in my household this past week. My 17 year old um, who drives and we let him go a couple of places. We have pretty um, strict, I would say, safety guidelines because of COVID of where he can go, what he can do. And so he wanted to go to the basketball court, practice basketball, which I'm like, great, awesome. Um, he was going in the evening after dinner and um, we have that conversation of, and, and in our household, it's not, I want you home by this time because I worry about teenagers driving fast to get home at a certain point. It is, I want you to leave your destination at this time. So that's kind of how, how we navigate that. So the expectation was that he would leave the basketball court at a certain time. I know how long it takes to get home. And um, it was about almost just almost 30 minutes after he should have left um, his, his, where he was. And it should only take 15, maybe 20 minutes to get home. So, and I had not heard from him. So that's another thing, like he did not communicate, um, send an update. So I texted him and asked, is everything okay? And he said, yeah, everything's fine. He went and picked up some, some food because he was hungry. <laughs> um, so there, our agreement of him leaving his destination and coming home, he did not hold his end of the bargain. As part of that, he did not then communicate or ask permission, say, I'm really hungry. I want to pick up, you know, from that food truck. Can I, can I do that? Um, so there was that lack of communication. So a natural consequence, which leading up to that, he had been late a couple of times. A natural consequence is then you're not holding up your, um, your responsibility of being able to use one of our vehicles. And so for the next week, you cannot. So I did not say you cannot see your girlfriend. I did not say you can't go any place. The natural consequence for that was you cannot then use the car. So while it may seem like a punishment, it's not. Like if you can't follow the rules, the, the you know, you have a right to go places and to use, um, a car, actually that's more of a privilege, but um, by not following that, the agreement, there is now this consequence. And so you can't really argue like he doesn't like it, um, but it is what it is. So that would be an example of a natural consequence, making sure that it aligns with whatever agreement was not. Um, and again, I see this a lot with parents as they, they punish their child in a way that makes absolutely no sense for whatever the child either did or did not do. So that's really important. So again, there's, there's six main ways um, to prevent problems. And I recommend incorporating all of them into family life. It's going to help to prevent a lot more problems. Um, you, you will see a difference. Now, solving problems. It comes down to, to, two, to two main things. And again, it might not solve every problem in the way that you would like it solved, but with practice, implementing these actually will solve problems. Practice. Um, so the first is express concerns. So when problems arise, 
from your parenting. Again, if you're at your centered self, um, you're going to be able to express your concerns. So um, with this example that I gave of my son, I could express, I was worried. I did not know where you were. My concern is that you did not communicate. Um, my concern is that you did something because you wanted to without, you know, it, it did not, um, it was not part of our agreement. So I could express that. And he then knew why I was not happy <laughs> with him in that moment, right? Being very clear. So it's kind of like the, um, the, the partner to the assertion in preventing problems, solving problems, you want to express your concern with the problem. Very clear, very direct. And if you're not able, uh, I think parents sometimes, um, if we are frustrated, we're angry, if we're already grouchy about something and a problem arises, we might um, make it bigger, right? We might then explode. Our aggressive or passive um, character might come out. And so if you're not able to even identify your concern, that is a clue that you might need to center yourself, right? You first must know why this thing bothered you, why it's a problem, why it's affecting you or others in the family. So that way you can express those concerns. I think um, even if we know what the concerns are, a lot of the times our expression of them is coming from our lower self. So we either yell, um, we, we tell people what they should do, right? Um, our concerns come out either aggressively or they don't come out because we are in our passive character or, it, or we might tiptoe around the concern. So expressing your concern, you really wanna make sure that you are centered, right? You can, you can um, identify the centered self character that needs to then express the concern. Part of that, again, as parents, I think it's sometimes easy to, to um, when problems arise, shift into that, well, I'm the parent, right? I know, or I make the rules. Um, and we sometimes forget to listen to our children, to listen um, to why this is a problem for them or why they behaved in a certain way. So it's really important in solving problems that you also consciously listen. And so again, if you're really worked up, if you're frustrated, if you're angry <laughs> with your child, it's really important to center yourself first. So that way you are able to listen to their concerns, right? They will probably express their own concerns um, in their attempt to solve a problem. And as a parent, you have to be able to listen. You have to be able to really hear it so that together you can solve the problem. And so again, with a lot of clients, um, this takes work. It takes customizing to the family. It takes um, practice and really, really looking more closely. But really solving problems comes down to expressing concerns, you as well as the people involved and conscious listening. And so if you are able to do that, start practice it, model it, your children, no matter their age, are going to start to learn those skills too. Super, super important. And so I wanna take a moment here to just check in and see if there are any questions or comments, if you want to put that in the chat. Okay, I will go ahead and move on, but if anything, no questions. Okay, awesome. Let's see. So now we're going to talk about the process um, for change, 
the last three steps in the six step process. Um, step four, we're gonna talk about crossing the bridge to the higher self. Step five, um, identifying with our higher self and step six, expressing the higher self. So if you recall, we had our centered self characters, right? The listener, the humanist, the observer, the pragmatist, and the realist. And, and if you recall from last week, I said, if you can function from your centered self, the majority of the time you are doing amazing, right? That is the goal. If you can get to 51% of the time being your centered self, you're on a roll. If you can get it higher than that, amazing. I like to be realistic with parents. I am not 100% functioning from my centered self. Um, it, it's just, it's just not realistic. So this is the goal, right? Um, shifting to the higher self is, I, I would say, an ultimate goal, right? It is even even our our truer self um and so like last week there is an activity that we will go through briefly but again this is something that you can on your own practice and take as much time as you need for it so i'll walk you through this now for those of you watching the recording do this. Um, it's, it's really, really important. So the first step. So if you remember last week when we talked about getting to your centered self, we did the breathing exercises where we had the imagery of the elevator moving up or the light or, you know, whatever you chose. So this, you kind of start um, from the centered place. If you are feeling you are in your lowered self, do that the activity from last week, getting to your centered self. And then once you are there, this would then be an extension of it. So you first want to focus your attention on your breathing, right? Inhaling, exhaling, taking really slow and deep like belly breaths, right? Where your, your breath gets all the way into your belly and you extend it out. So you're going to continue that, right? Just focusing on your breath for a few minutes. And again, it, it, it's up to you when you're doing this on your own, how long. And you're going to notice that your body is more relaxed, right? It's going to feel nice just that breathing. I recommend that you do this with your eyes closed, but again, some people don't like that. But it helps with the next step where you're going to just kind of quiet your feelings. So as you're breathing, you're going um, to imagine, right? You, you know where your body is, your physical body. You're going to imagine, in addition to a physical body, that you also have a feeling body, right? That, that, that holds your feelings. And that it takes the shape of an oval. And this feeling body extends about one to two feet beyond your actual physical body. So you want to, want to imagine, right, outside of yourself, this oval. Still focusing on your breathing. And you're going to fill that oval that extends beyond your physical body with the color blue. And blue, because that often is associated with peace and calm. So as you inhale and exhale, 
you're going to imagine that feeling body, that blue feeling body, and enjoy the serenity, right? It'll probably calm you a little bit. The next step is to then clear your mind. So in addition to your physical body and your feeling body, consider that you also have a mind body. And you can envision this mind body to be the shape of a sphere or a circle that extends another one to two feet beyond your feeling body. So you have your physical body, you have an, a blue oval feeling body that extends, and then you're going to have this circular mind body. And as you breathe, I want you to feel, fill that sphere with the color yellow, inviting clarity and openness. And then for a few moments, again, on your own, you would do this for as long as you'd like. You are going to acknowledge with your breath, your clear and receptive mind. Now the next step in this exercise is to then identify with your higher self. So you have your physical body, your feeling body, your mind body. And then I want you to imagine a golden white sun about a foot or so above your head that symbolizes your higher self. And imagine the sun's rays reaching down and entering your body through the top of your head right? Slowly moving down through your entire physical body with healing energy. So let that light flow beyond the physical body into your feeling body, allowing you to experience greater love and compassion. See the light flowing into your mind body. Now think of yourself as a luminous, right? You're bright, you're shining, you're a wise being that is now identified with your higher self. And so again, that imagery, it just like expands you, right? thinking of not just you as a body, but a feeling body, mind body, and that, that wisdom that comes through you. And so when you're ready, I invite you to just come back from that experience. And if you wanna share something in the chat, what that was like for you, And so you can also see that if you are, oh, it was great, awesome. If you are at your lower self and you recognize that and you then shift to your centered self. And then if you want to move from your centered self into your higher self, you can see how that could take some time. And I recommend parents do that, especially when they are feeling um, angry or frustrated, or there is, you know, something that has them really worked up, um, a problem that has arisen that you are feeling very emotionally charged about. To set aside some time and do this before you respond, before you react. Um, and it can be as simple as you being assertive, right? Asserting, um, being very clear in, I am feeling 
very emotionally charged right now. You don't have to identify, you can, you can say I'm very angry and very frustrated. You can just say, I'm feeling very emotional right now and I need to gather myself before I address this. And so that's stating your needs, that's being assertive and you're building some space for you to then do these exercises and to get yourself, at least get to a centered place. If you are there and you, are, you want to then move into your higher self, this is a great extension. But it could take some time. If you're really worked up doing that breathing, it might take you 30 minutes. It could take you longer before you are really like, okay, I am, I am here in my higher self. And so the next step, the fifth step of our whole six step process is to then identify with the higher self. And um, I'm gonna introduce you to these characters, the intuitive, the peacemaker, the fair witness, the faithful and pure love. And so the intuitive, the higher self character, um, is really around that intuition is the source of our deepest knowing. Um, this one really hits home because what a lot of people refer to as intuition is what I call essential wisdom. Um, and so I do believe that our essential wisdom is the source of our deepest knowing. The peacemaker. In a conflict, everyone's needs can be met, right? Everyone. The fair witness says that each person's point of view has value. The faithful, when we value relationship more than our upset, Growth is possible for everyone involved. Pure love. Even if expectations are not met, we can always give love. Right? And those are, those are really beautiful. When I say that, I'm like, oh, yes. And so our higher self characters can um, come through. And, and again, this is an ideal and it takes practice um, when the issues arise, right? So authority, who knows best? When you are functioning from the intuitive character, you are able to tap into your intuition, your essential wisdom as the source of deep knowing, right? Whose needs will be met? The peacemaker. In a conflict, everyone's needs can be met. Again, needs is the important word. Um, not once, there's a big difference. And, and a lot of times our children and sometimes ourselves are following from our wants and not our needs. So if you, the peacemaker is able to then identify the needs. Issues around perception, whose point of view is right? Is there a right, right? The fair witness is saying each person's point of view has a value. So there is no right. Issues of control, like who should decide? The faithful, says when we value relationship more than our upset, growth is possible. So even when, when we are not happy, the fact that we love our children, love our other family members, that is able to help us work through that, right? Expectations, how do we deal with expectations? The pure love character, um, acknowledges that even if expectations are not met, we can always give love. So even when um, breaking an agreement, breaking, breaking a rule, um, not holding up their end of the bargain, we can still come from a place of love. 
even if we have to implement natural consequences, it's through love, right? And so that's how you can um, parent. And really, again, this comes in in other areas of life too, the higher self characters function. And so then the next step, the final step um, in the six step process is then expressing the higher self. How do we um, show that? And so this is um, deep work and, and I'm gonna talk about it briefly, but know that expressing your higher self takes practice. It takes really um, challenging yourself to sometimes function very differently than maybe you're used to. It might take um, breaking some patterns in how you parent or how you um, live your life. So the intuitive, you want to develop your parenting intuition, right? to be able to recognize the messages of essential wisdom hidden within the ordinary cues that our children express, right? So really um, tapping into what you likely, I believe we all know the answers, that they're in there somewhere. Um, and so developing that parenting intuition. Um, for the peacemaker, strengthen family bonds through creative problem solving, right? Trust grows when parents commit to finding wins-win solutions that meet everyone's needs. Again, it doesn't mean you're going to shift into a passive um, character that just lets your kids do whatever they want or get whatever they want. No, it's really based on needs. So um, as a parent, being creative with problem solving and finding solutions is really important. The fair witness, you know, this, this comes when there's, there's painful conflicts. It, you know, conflicts aren't always, <laughs> I would say they're usually not fun, but they can actually be pretty painful. There can be big, strong emotions. So the fair witness, you want to transform painful conflicts into opportunities for growth. And I think as parents, that's what we want for our children, right? E even, even when they're much older, we want to see them grow. We want to see them be successful. And so how we shift our conflicts to opportunities from growth, right? It starts with valuing that relationship with our children more than our upset, our annoyance, our, you know, when we think we know what's best for them, it's really tapping into the relationship that we want with them, that we want for them. And then um, to allow ourselves and them to find unexpected possibilities for genuine understanding and healing. So even if you still in your mind think you know <laughs> the best route, sometimes as parents we do because we're older, we've experienced more of life, but how can we then shift into um, really functioning from a place of building and strengthening that relationship with our child and allowing them to grow? through whatever situation is arising. That's often more powerful. The faithful embrace the power of acceptance as a catalyst for change. So um, again, as a parent, this can be tough, you know? It, it, you know, we have accepting maybe choices that our children make of all ages, um, but acceptance provides a space of emotional safety and the ideal environment for children to flourish and mature, right? If we can accept them, if we can accept what they are um, working through, if we can accept choices that they make, it doesn't mean we like them. It doesn't mean we agree with them, 
but having a, an overall self, sense of acceptance provides emotional safety for them. And so it will help them to work through their problems, work through their challenges, work through our challenges with them, but really allows them to mature and to grow. And that can be hard, right? Accepting um, things that our, our children do. Again, it doesn't mean it's okay. Um, it doesn't mean it's right, but allowing that space for them. And then this one, and I think all parents um, believe in this, is to love unconditionally, right? It's sometimes hard to express that to our children. And so as we learn to practice forgiveness, right? Because a lot of conflict, um, when that arrives, when family challenges arise, when personal challenges arise, um, we can be hurt. Um, they can be hurt. So when we learn to practice forgiveness, sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's a little harder, we're then able to give the ultimate form of love, really, truly unconditional love. And so that's, you know, our higher self parent. And um, it sounds beautiful and like, yes, that's, that's what I want. And it's sometimes, I would say often, not super easy. But once we're able to, to practice and get there, it really does transform our family life. Um, it, it really can make huge and significant differences. And so that's kind of the end of the content. I'm going to um, stop the, the recording. So those of you watching this, if you have questions um, about the content, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, I will be, you will have received this recording with um, some additional resources and um, yeah, reach out to me. So let me push stop.